Hello and welcome to Calchi Media's Invest Nest webinar series. Now today we'll hear from three experts from the materials and battery space. My name is Rachel Jones. I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before going ahead with the session, it is important to remember that this webinar is for informational purposes only. It's not a solicitation or recommendation to engage in any investment activity under discussion. We're neither licensed nor qualified to provide investment advice through this platform. Now, the key idea of InvestNest webinar is to present a panel of experts to share information about their business, growth strategies, and their company's value and vision. We'll have 15 minutes of business presentation, followed by five minutes of questions and answers from the viewers. Now, webinar attendees can post their questions in the Q&A chat box during the webinar. If due to time constraints, we're unable to take your questions live, you can send them through to us at info at and we'll get your emails answered by our panelists. As we know, vast quantities of critical minerals are needed for clean energy generation. Now, companies involved in providing specialty minerals, such as lithium and uranium, have to watch the pace and scale up their operations to cater to the increasing global demand for zero emission energy sources. Now, in this webinar, we'll focus on three ASX listed companies that are supporting this transition with their advancements in the materials sector. Firstly, we have Tempest Minerals, a mineral exploration company with a diversified portfolio of projects in WA, highly prospective for precious base and energy metals. Now, the company aims to be a leading player in the mineral industry through its phenomenal work in sustainable business, innovation and science. Secondly, we'll understand how specialty battery technology company Altec Batteries is revolutionizing energy storage and battery materials to support the energy transition from a fossil fuel carbon-based economy to a renewable energy economy. And next, we'll learn more about the multi-commodity company Horanga Resources. They're involved in developing highly prospective projects from feasibility through to large-scale production in West Africa. The company holds interests in a gold project and a uranium project in Senegal. I'm happy to introduce our speakers for the day, Mr. Don Smith, Managing Director of Tempest Minerals, Mr. Iggy Tan, Managing Director of Altec Batteries, and Mr. John Davis, Non-Executive Director of Haranga Resources. Now, firstly, let's start with Don Smith, Managing Director of Tempest. Geologist and entrepreneur Don has played the part of a founding director at many resource companies, including Platypus Resources and Alderan Resources. Currently, he's associated with a few startups and consults to the industry. Welcome to Calchi Media's Invest Nest webinar, Don. If you would like to share your presentation deck and take over the virtual stage. Thanks a lot, Rachel. I'll, uh, I'll do that. Stand by. That's working, yes? Excellent. Perfectly. Thank you. Great. All right. Welcome to the Tempest presentation. Uh, I'll go through the uh, obligatory disclaimer there. Everyone can read that in, uh, in their own time at their leisure. So I'm going to do a bit about our company first up. Uh, we're Western Australian based. We, we have a number of projects here in Western Australia. However, uh, as we've been around for a few years now, we've had uh, dealings and projects in, in other jurisdictions as well. And we still have commercial uh, exposure to those. So we're extremely um, attractively priced at the moment, uh, considering the value of the projects we have. And uh, we have a, a very tight register there and uh, a reasonable amount of cash in, in the bank and investments, which isn't uh, reflected in that number on the screen. So I'll, I'll launch into bit more about us. So we uh, we have a great board. You can see there's an array of highly experienced team there, um, notably Brian Moller as our chairman, who is uh, famous for for starting and, and being chairman of Soul Gold previously. And uh, and the other guys there have uh, had non-trivial uh, successes themselves as well. In terms of sustainability, I 
uh, it's it's a critical thing in in the modern world. Um, despite the glowing intro from Rachel, I'm I'm not going to focus on that too much at this moment. Apart from that, it is critical to uh, our future as an industry and also uh, transitioning to this this new low carbon uh, environment. Uh, we have always, from the beginning, as a as a pure lithium explorer in 2017 to till now, we've always upheld the highest standards of uh, sustainability across environment, uh, social, and and corporate governance. So there's nothing new there that we have to talk about. It's just we're we're doing it. One thing I do want to point out is our our focus on innovation. Uh, certainly, that's that's a big part of of what we're doing as as a company. So. Uh, we have a fully digital workplace and uh, we're using an array of, of new things. So you can see there's a, uh, a box scan unit in the top left picture there uh, that has automated what was five manual tasks in the past and turned it into one very easy, easy thing. And so we, we put all our samples through that and that data, that objective data goes straight into our database. So a bit about our projects. As I mentioned earlier, we're, we're Western Australia focused. You can see the large red icon there, but we have commercial exposure. So through deals, cash flow, shares, this kinds of thing, we, we have uh, exposure to a number of projects around the globe that you can see there. So back to Western Australia, here on the left-hand side, we can see uh, the array of projects that we're, we're currently working on. We've got uh, lithium, copper, gold, um, all the critical minerals there and, uh, and, and in a number of different locations so that we have uh, diversity and we can, we can move around when we need to. So first up, I'm going to talk about the Yalgoo project. Uh, so that's about a thousand square kilometers. It's a, it's a non-trivial project. It has all the uh, infrastructure that you could possibly want. So the, the bars for exploration are quite low there. It's only four hours drive from Perth. Uh, it has power, water, rail, several highways, telecoms, the lot. And uh, we've already proven that the historical geological interpretation in the area is is, is not correct. And uh, there's a lot more opportunity for to find world-class base and precious metal and energy metal uh, deposits here. And that's what I'm going to talk about in a moment. So if we zoom in there, we can see there's, a, there's an overview of our land holding with uh, a number of the, the very serious projects that are in, in the region. So uh, the geology previously was thought to be um, completed. And uh, we've recently, in the last year or two, discovered that there's a whole new belt of the same rocks that host these world-class deposits, and no one's ever looked at them before. And we've done uh, quite a bit of work over there in the last few years. And last year, we had quite a high profile discovery, um, even if it didn't have uh, the, the greatest grade at the time, but it was the first hole into a brand new region. And uh, yeah, all the holes that we've drilled so far have been mineralized. Um, we've got base metals, precious metals, and, and critical minerals um, coming out of everywhere. So it's a bit of a first world problem to have. Uh, drilling lots of holes and getting mineralization. Now we're focused on uh, honing in where the economic part of that is. There's an example of some of the drilling we did uh, towards the end of last year. Uh, and you can see that the, the red is copper plus zinc. So if it was a, a normal copper value in the rock, it would be a thin gray line. And uh, all, those, all those big red spikes show that we're onto something there. Excitingly, um, because this is a large project, we have uh, many tens of kilometres of rocks that have never been explored. Uh, at the eastern end of our project, we have what's called the remorse target. The remorse target was uh, discovered through soil sampling, so sampling the, the surface and looking at the chemistry of that. And we can see there, that particularly the, the, the pink and blue colours on that diagram, that's, uh, that's very high-grade copper and zinc and very, very contiguous. So it's all in a nice layers. And that's very rare to see that in soil sampling. So we're very excited to get in and do some drilling um, probably next quarter. 
uh, to to find out what's under the ground there. And relatedly, uh, mid this year, we flew a regional electromagnetic survey, EM survey, and uh, that was done by helicopter and it covered quite a large area, as you can see on the right hand side of that image there. The green area, so we've only announced this today, the green area there is what we, we flew on this survey. And in our first round of processing, so we're running quite a number of different algorithms and, and processing techniques on this data. Um, our first round, we've come up with quite a number of quite compelling targets already. And uh, some of those targets uh, correlate quite strongly with targets that we had generated using other techniques such as magnetics and geochemistry and old fashioned geology in the bush. And uh, including the remorse target I mentioned before. So that's quite, quite important that that's quite a compelling target uh, from a surface standpoint, now we're looking using geophysics and we can see that there's a, a signal coming from below the ground as well. Moving on to our next project, which is in Mount Magnet. Uh, Mount Magnet is a prolific gold area in Australia. For those who aren't aware, many, many millions of ounces have been produced from here. Um, we have a, uh, a significant land holding in the middle of, of everything. So literally right abutting uh, the, the billion dollar market cap, Remilius Resources, that's the green on that picture there, on the right hand side picture. And uh, you can see there's a number of, quite a number of ongoing production targets um, or production uh, centers uh, right beside our, our project. And we know that there is gold on our project. We've discovered old workings that have uh, quite a bit of uh, gold in in the in the tailings from those from those workings, and also our our recent geochemistry is indicating that there's uh, sizable targets. So that's another drilling target for for early next year. This is a relatively new story. I haven't spoken about in presentations yet. Um, we we picked up some some new ground uh, earlier this year, and this is one of them. It's called the Five Wheels Project. So. For anyone who's familiar with Rumble Resources or Strickland Resources, um, they've both made what appear to be world-class discoveries in the Irrahidi region near Waluna here in WA. And uh, we were looking at the geology of this for quite a long time, and uh, recently some ground became available, so we've, we've grabbed hold of it. And uh, if we go to the next slide there, you can see we're, we're quite proximal to the Rumble discovery. And there's, a, there's an important geological unit that uh, so far appears to be the, the place to look for, for mineralization. And we believe that that same, uh, that same geolog geological structure goes through our five wheels project to the north there as well. So there's 260 kilometers of, of uh, ground there, more than 50 kilometers of strike, and it's never been explored for base metals. Uh, it's previously been explored for iron ore and some of the chemistry seems to have elevated base metals in, in the soil sampling. So um, I'm actually heading out there tomorrow to go and uh, initiate field work and uh, do some reconnaissance and start work on this project. So we're quite excited to, to get into that before Christmas and have some news flow for, for our listeners and investors. Similarly, we've, uh, we've picked up another project at the same time. Uh, this is called the Elephant Project. So this is a pure gold play at this stage, um, but it is very proximal to the uh, world-class uh, Tropicana deposit, which is on the boundary of the Albany Fraser region and the Yilgarn region. So if we go to the next slide, you can see there's a you can see there's a giant uh, structure, this blue color going down the middle of the screen here. That's the boundary between these two regions. That's an excellent place to find world-class deposits. And indeed, that's where Tropicana and several other of the deposits on that screen are. Uh, at the Elephant Project, we have quite compelling geophysical anomaly, uh, which is reminiscent of other major deposits in the region. And there's also an eight kilometer gold geochemical anomaly at the surface. So that is enormous. And that's uh, that's where I guess the, the name of the project comes from. So uh, we're currently completing that deal. And when the conditions precedent and, and the transactions being completed, I'll have more news for everyone on that one. 
but of course next year we'll be uh we'll be getting into that one as soon as possible getting drilling and uh and other work done so stand by on that one You may have noticed earlier on the uh, the world map that we have uh, exposure to a project in PNG. So we made a, a investment in this, a, mil a million dollars last year, and uh, this company is about to list on the ASX at a substantial premium to that price. Um, it's a world class deposit. It was mined for for several decades previously at at uh, an astounding rate of of half an ounce, um, about fifteen grams per ton, and uh, yeah, we're looking really, really looking forward to seeing uh, some action there. And I know that uh, the there's there's quite a likelihood that 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 is going to that resource that you can see there. It's about half a million ounces. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that that doubles in in the coming years, and uh, and that gets back into production. So uh, it's all part of our growth strategy of uh, not just exploring, but also uh, getting closer to to being a producer and a developer. As I mentioned earlier, we were originally a lithium exploration company, um, and as such, we still have uh, quite an exposure to that commodity. And it's, as I'm sure Iggy and others were going to tell us uh, later later in this presentation, that it's critical to that transformation to a to a uh, energy storage, and uh, and and that kind of thing. So if we look here, we've got. Um, our main lithium exploration project is called Rocky Hill. So that's only about an hour away from Perth. Um, and previous work that we've done there, uh, we've done some soil sampling there also, had quite substantial lithium 60 plus ppm in soils, which is, is very serious. Um, we're currently waiting on a tenant to be granted there so that we can expand this project significantly and, and get into some more exploration there. Uh, this, this is part of the southwest terrain, which is one of the, the main geological uh, provinces in Western Australia where people are looking for lithium right now. As I mentioned, we also have commercial exposure to some other lithium projects around the world, um, including the high profile Argosy project there in Nevada. Uh, we're, we're also investigating ways that we can create greater value uh, through our lithium projects to, to um, get more value to the shareholders. There'll be more news on that coming out uh, this or, or early next year. All right, so in terms of what's coming up from Tempest, uh, we can say we've got a, a bit of a, a Gantt chart there for everyone to look at. Uh, at the very minimum, we have uh, a number of field campaigns uh, planned for the rest of this quarter. And then early next year, we'll be going straight into to more field work and potentially some drilling pending, some approvals and other things that we're waiting for currently. So plenty of, uh, plenty of exciting news flow for, for investors and, new, and, uh, and observers to coming. And if anyone is attending one of these uh, events that you can see at the bottom, uh, for example, I'll be at IMARC in, in two weeks in Sydney. Um, I'd, I'd love to have a chat, so come and come and come and talk to me at any of those events. So, reiterating what I've said, uh, very modest value explorer right now, considering the great value that we we have on our books, uh, and we've got a lot of news flow coming up. We're also de-risk, so we're multi-commodity. We're not at the behest of uh, whatever's fashionable in the market uh, from month to month. If you want to find out more about Tempest Minerals, make sure that you drop by our website. Uh, and particularly there, we have our investor hub uh, where there's uh, me speaking on video for every announcement that we put out. And also we've got some docu-series there uh, called Inside Tempest where you can learn more about how we work and what we're doing. That's it. Thanks everyone for listening. Thank you so much there, Don Smith, for that really interesting presentation. It definitely seems like you lot have a lot going on, particularly for next year. It'll be very interesting to see all the new things that you have working out for you there. Now, we are moving on next now to Mr. Iggy Tan. 
Mr. Rikitan is the managing director of Ultec Batteries, a highly skilled mining and chemical executive. He holds over three decades of experience in commercial mining projects. Now, he's been involved in the commissioning and startup of seven resource projects in Australia and overseas. So welcome to Kalkai Media's Invest Nest webinar, Mr. Iggy Tan. If you would like to share your well, presentation. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Great to see All you. Right. I don't know if everybody can see that. What's the, the future of grid storage batteries? Um, now, if you think about the future of lithium-ion batteries, uh, they're all moving towards solid-state technology. And just a bit of an explanation what solid-state technology is. In a lithium battery, you've got the cathode and the anode, and in between there's a liquid electrolyte, which is actually flammable. And uh, that's been causing some battery fires around the world. So the industry is moving to solid-state, where they replace the liquid electrolyte with a solid ceramic and the ceramic allows the lithium ions to go back and forth um what we see some of the issues around the world is uh, uh fires uh lithium uh batteries of causing some cons concern with battery fires and so on um so there are some of the safety issues uh when you have a lithium battery fire it's, it's uh, generally called thermal runaway and uh, there's a lot of overheating. And uh, what's different about a lithium battery fire is that it's very difficult to put out because it generates oxygen at the cathode end. So that's one of the challenges of the battery fires. Uh, lithium batteries only operate in a very limited temperature range, so between 15 and 35 degrees. But when it gets very cold, the, the, the liquid electrolyte slows down and... Um, the battery actually slows its capacity. So that's one of the other challenges. The industry uh, generally accepts that the life of these batteries are between 8 to 10 years. And the reason for that is that lithium degrades every time you charge and discharge a battery. So when you're talking about grid storage batteries, yeah, you want batteries beyond that 10-year life. There's also concerns about the price of the critical metals. Uh, in lithium, the price has gone up three to four times in the last uh, two years. So that's a, a concern for the lithium battery industry. Cobalt, 70% of cobalt comes from the Republic of Congo, and there are child labor issues. So the industry is concerned about ethical supply. Um, one country produces all the graphite of uh, uh, the industry. So China produces 90% of graphite material for the, the world battery industry. And that represents a geopolitical concern for the industry. And then finally, copper. There is a copper crunch. Uh, there's enough studies that show there's not enough copper mines being built uh, to service uh, the forecast for EVs. So is there a battery that is actually fireproof, has a large temperature range, um, life beyond 15 years with no lithium, no cobalt, no graphite, no copper, and no manganese, and introducing you to the Serenergy batteries. Uh, the technology was developed uh, by the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany uh, over eight years. They spent nearly 35 million euros. Uh, and essentially, there are salt batteries, sodium chloride, and solid state technology. So I mentioned about solid state previously. Um, these batteries, because they use a ceramic tube instead of the liquid electrolyte, is totally uh, fireproof, uh, which is a, a big benefit uh, to the industry. Uh, they operate in a very wide temperature range, down to minus 40 degrees and up to 60 degrees. And the reason it can operate at those temperatures, because internally, the battery is about 270 degrees. It's fully insulated, so you can actually touch it on the outside. But it's the analogy, it's a bit like a mammal. It's got its own temperature regulation. Uh, the life of the battery is beyond uh, 10 years because the sodium doesn't degrade every time you charge and discharge the battery. So well over 15-year life. Uh, and the most important thing, we use sodium chloride. 
Sodium is a very reactive material like lithium. It's just under lithium in the on the periodic table. Uh, and it's very readily available. It's cheap. And uh, and really, that's we feel that that's the technology for grid storage batteries. We don't have any cobalt in the batteries. The, the chemistry doesn't require any cobalt. Uh, and we also don't have any um, graphite or copper. In fact, we don't have any anodes in the battery. It forms the anode when it charges the battery, and then it dissolves the anode when it discharges the battery. So it's a self-forming anode. So hence, there's no copper or graphite required. Uh, and then finally, how the battery works. I mean, the video is not working at the moment, but I'll just talk you through it. It's a ceramic tube. And within that tube, there is a we filled it with salt and nickel metal powder. There's a pot is positive probe, and the battery sits in a metal cylinder. So if we compare the battery with the um, lithium ion battery, a very similar energy density. Uh, it has very good conversion. The cycle life, as I mentioned, is nearly double. Very safe in that uh, it's totally fireproof. Uh, and it operates in a very wide temperature range. The most important thing about the batteries is that it has a very low maintenance cost. So in a Tesla mega pack, there's something like 26 cooling fans and two air conditioners trying to keep the battery cool. Uh, and this also happens in your electric vehicles with lithium ion batteries. Our batteries maintain the temperature when you charge and discharge the batteries. Where we sit on the, the curve, this is the curve where you can compare the batteries. On the bottom axis is, is how much energy the battery can deliver. On the vertical axis is how much power the battery can deliver. So uh, if you look at the red red curve, that's lithium ion batteries. On the left-hand side is the very powerful nickel cobalt batteries, which uh, you need a lot of power quickly. And then at the bottom of that is the lithium iron phosphate batteries. They're all lithium batteries. But um, as you would know, Tesla has announced that all, all their vehicles are moving to LFP batteries because they're much safer and, and much cheaper. Our batteries sit in the middle. We can produce power as well as energy. Um, the sector that we are focusing on is in the grid storage market. Uh, the grid storage market is expected to grow at 28% year on year uh, from 4 billion expected to be about 15 billion by 2025 and then climbing to about 150 billion by 2030. Uh, as Elon Musk from uh, Tesla says, their growth they see in the future uh, with their battery division will come from the grid storage market. Now, let me explain to you what is a grid storage battery? Um, essentially, um, Australia has a third of the households in Australia have solar panels. Uh, and during the day, uh, we generate electricity. Uh, because we generate electricity, our demand is also down. So demand during the day is down. And there is actually a surplus of renewable energy during the day. So in California, they actually have to discharge 3 billion worth of uh, renewable energy every year to the ground. Uh, in uh, Germany, about $2 billion is wasted. I read an article that in Australia, 30% of renewable energy is actually discharged to the ground. And the reason for that is that there is no storage. Uh, so if you could store, if you could charge batteries that is connected to the grid, during the day and then discharge it during the night that is grid storage battery so it's essentially uh energy shifting from the day to the night and uh, a lot of the households that have solar panels also uh, want some batteries but of today the cost of the batteries are too pro pro prohibitive we're ready to commercialize this technology uh the Fronthofer Institute have built a pilot plant and started producing these batteries. Uh, they've spent nearly 25 million euros in its development. So we're not a, a startup. We're actually commercializing technology that's already around. And we're building a 100 megawatt 
uh, project in Saxony, Germany, where we own 75% of the joint venture, and Fraunhofer, 25%. Um, we're located in east part of Germany, and uh, we are well away. We're just about to uh, launch the definitive feasibility study for this plan. As you can see, there is a lot of uh, automation and um, robotics that is designed in the plan. We're producing these cells uh, at about uh, one every 45 seconds. This is uh, what the product looks like. It's a 60 kilowatt battery pack, um, about um, rated at about 100 amps and 600 volts. There are 240 of these cells. You can see a picture of those cells up the top right-hand corner. These, these battery packs will then go into C containers, uh, pre-assembled, and we call these our one megawatt grid packs. The idea of this is that you can uh, deliver to site already prefabricated and assembled, uh, drop it on the deck, and plug and play. So within five minutes of delivery, you have one megawatt connected to your grid supply. So as I mentioned, grid storage batteries are essentially energy shifting, shifting the uh, energy from the day to the night time. That's what our one megawatt grid pack looks like. Um, and we have some vision of the battery production. This is a picture of one of these cells. Uh, and um, the plan is that um, we will shortly issue the definitive feasibility study. We'll look at uh, off-takers and then start to uh, look at funding for the project. So... That is the, so the, to answer the question, that is the future of grid storage batteries. Thank you so much there, Mr. Igitan, for that insightful presentation. Obviously, all companies are moving very much so with the times. Next, we're moving on to Mr. John Davis. He's the non-executive director of Haranga Resources. Now, Mr. Davis is a geologist with more than 30 years experience in mineral exploration and development here in Australia and in South Africa. That includes gold base metals and rare metals. He has extensive experience in the gold sector from regional exploration and resource development to production. Welcome to Calchine Media's Invest Nest webinar, Mr. John Davis. Now, if you would like to share your presentation deck and take over our virtual stage. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, good morning and afternoon, everybody. Um, Moving through the Haranga presentation, we'll start with the disclaimer and I'll give you an opportunity to read that at some point. Um, investment highlights we'll start with here um, and obviously a, a bit about the background of Haranga. Haranga listed on the ASX in January 2022, that's January last year, um, with a focus on uranium and gold projects in West Africa, uh, more specifically in Senegal, which we'll get to shortly. Um, and the interesting part, and I think part of the investment highlights are the fact that um, uranium prices continue to perform very strongly in 2023, with the spot price up more than 30%, up to in, in excess of 72 US dollars a pound for uranium. Our projects, we had some prior exploration being completed with over 68,000 metres of drilling, uh, radiometric surveys, magnetic surveys, et cetera, at our Soraya project, which I'll get into in a bit more detail later. But this da data enabled us to review and validate and, in fact, report a maiden resource estimate, mineral resource estimate under Jork Code 2012, uh, only in September, just last month. Um, over 16 million pounds inferred. Um, Senegal has a very stable government, good infrastructure, numerous operating gold mines, providing good infrastructure and access, skilled labour, sealed roads, etc. In fact, there's over 40 million ounces of gold in resources 
and production uh, in Senegal as we speak. The gold potential also is significant in, and as well as uranium, and the structures have led to a significant project at Ebel South, which we'll also discuss in a bit of detail. Uh, significantly, in-country costs are very low when it comes to exploration work, and we have a very experienced board and management team with significant industry experience from exploration to production, including uranium in Africa and associated with AX, ASX listed companies. We have on the ground West African based staff with regional and historic understanding, which is a great uh, benefit to our projects. Just a bit of company, company information. The current share price is around 15 or 16 cents. We have uh, 75 million shares on issue, quite a small, uh, tightly held share structure. Um, we have a market cap of around $12 million and cash on hand currently 1.65 million, although there's another 1.2 million to be uh, subject to shareholder approval uh, in the near future. The board, as mentioned, um, we have a, a strong board. Peter Batten, our managing director, who was going to be presenting today, unfortunately is in Senegal as we speak, uh, looking at our next um, upcoming drilling programs. Peter was a founding managing director of Bannerman Resources uh, in Namibia. And of course, um, Bannerman is currently still producing uranium uh, and so on. So it's a very strong uranium background and that'll be a great benefit, obviously, to Haranga as we go forward. Um, Non-executive Hendrik Shiloman, he's also based in uh, Africa, in Cape Town. And on the ground, our COO is um, uh, a lot of experience and lived more than 20 years in Senegal, based in Dakar. And he is the manager of all our exploration efforts um, in Senegal. And our uh, non-executive chairman, Michael Davey, a businessman um, based in Perth. Global uranium, uranium demand is soaring, uh, and this is not uh, something new, and, and it's been discussed, and we'll um, add more to that as we move through the slides. I'll leave this slide till later. Interestingly enough, um, investment in nuclear energy um, is significant. At, currently, there is world nuclear reactor Reactors currently operating are 438. Um, there's 58 under construction and there's 100, another 104 being planned. Uh, and the Chinese have currently 55 operating reactors, uh, 21 under construction and 47 planned. So, and if you look around that slide, you'll see the countries that have current producing nuclear reactors. Uh, and very positive and lots of expansion going on. So there's a big uh, move and demand for uh, nuclear power. Just looking at the uranium price, um, from around mid-2021, where the price was sitting around $30 a pound, as I mentioned earlier, it's now moved up to over $72 US a pound um, over the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, Senegal, just briefly, um, it gained independence from France in 1960. It's a very democratic country, very politically stable. Um, the population is around 17 million, various ethnic groups. The capital city is Dakar, uh, which is the most populous urban centre and has made significant investments in infrastructure and development uh, and significant progress in reliability of supply of electricity, etc. cetera. Uh, so going on with Senegal, it's got a very strong mining code, very pro-mining, um, which was developed in 2017. Uh, it's a very positive, and as I mentioned earlier, there are some significant gold projects um, in production, um, being led by um, Endeavour Mining, Resolute, Chesa, and Manajem, um, producing significant amounts of gold, uh, particularly in the southeastern part of um, Senegal, as you can see on that plan. 
Now, moving to our Soraya Uranium Project, it's a joint venture between Haranga, 70%, and Mandinga Resources, 30 and they have a free carried uh, to PFS and relates to an exploration permit, which you can see on the plan to the right there, which covers an area of 1,650 square kilometres. So it's a very significant area over the Soraya granite. Um, the ground was partially explored by uh, French giants Arriva and Kojima prior to 2010, and the uranium mineralisation was identified. The uranium price fell significantly, so those companies uh, withdrew from the project. Uh, Haranga acquired the project as part of the listing of Haranga last year and have been exploring since. In, uh, I guess very importantly, historic drilling totaled some 68,000 metres of combined RC, diamond, uh, drilling, etc. And Haranga has used that information to come up with the current resource, as mentioned earlier. Um, all the drilling really sits above 160 vertical metres, so very shallow at this point. So the potential for uh, extensions is significant. As I mentioned, the project, uh, all the historical data has been verified. And in fact, uh, Haranga drilled 22 diamond holes in 2022 for over 3,000 metres of core drilling. And generated a mineral resource estimate following that work and which outlined over 16 million pounds of contained EU-308 at a grade of 587 ppm, EU-308, which is significantly high grade, which uh, uh, translates into 7,300 tonnes of contained uranium metal. So a very robust project. And more significantly, you'll see in the following slide, the Soraya prospect where that resource is located is uh, where my, in the centre of that slide on the right, Soraya, there are another six significant um, uh, coincident radiometric surface geochemical anomalies of all greater tenor than the Soraya resource prospect. Uh, these have not been drilled to any extent and are going to form the basis of the ongoing exploration. So the upside for significant further resource definition on this project um, is, is, we believe, to be very significant. Moving on, we mentioned earlier that we have a gold project called Ebel South, which uh, is located not far from the uh, Soraya Uranium project, and you can see that on the far side of that uh, slide down in the uh, southwest corner. Um, we have approximately um, a two and a half kilometer strike length here of significant uh, gold anomalism up to 643 ppb gold, which is in fact about half a gram. So at surface, also on the project, there is significant artisanal workings. And so showing strong evidence of gold mineralization. And as I mentioned earlier, there's significant gold um, mineralization in the district in that southwest, southeastern corner of Senegal uh, with significant gold producing um, projects. Just looking at a project timeline for the Soraya Uranium project, later this, uh, as I said, our managing director Peter Batten is currently on site. We're looking at coming out of the wet season with uh, metallurgical test work, uh, further drilling, um, upgrading the resource and so on through next year. And uh, we believe that we will have a new resource at least classified under the indi indicated category um, uh, next year. So we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of news flow to come out, uh, moving through uh, those various uh, aspects of exploration on the Soraya project. Um, in a summary, in terms of the project, Senegal is a stable geopolitical location with pro-mining and government, uh, with fairly recent updated mining laws in 2017. Oranga has a maiden mineral resource of estimate of 16 million pounds inferred at 587 ppm EU 308 for Soraya. 
And it's the first, as I mentioned, of six known radiometric and geochemical anomalies to be explored in Senegal um, uh, over the next year. Three of the remaining anomalies will be drill ready by late November. Um, and more significantly, as part of this whole process, global uranium demand is increasing as seen in the plus 30% increase in the spot price and utilities returning to long-term contracts. The world's embracing nuclear power for its clean carbon-free electricity generating capabilities and with a true baseload component of 24-7, 365-day reliability. The West's becoming conscious of the vulnerability inherent in, in outsourcing power generation. And so Haringa's Senegal-based team is able to move quickly on any opportunities that present itself within Africa and specifically West Africa. And of course, the Ebel South Gold Prospect um, with anomalous gold results uh, in a fertile gold territory are also drill ready. So that's a summary and uh, of Haranga and where we're at. Very exciting times, having just produced a maiden mineral resource estimate for uranium and of significantly high grade and with a huge upside for further discovery and increasing resources um, moving forward. Thank you, Rachel. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mr. John Davis. And um, send our wishes to Mr. Batten. Sorry he couldn't be with us today, but it was great to have you talking through the presentation there. That was fabulous. So now we're going to go to our Q&A from the audience. So first up, back to you, Don. Um, we have a message through here from Mr. Mike Noon. He's messaged in to say, does current market scenario have any kind of impact to your projects? Uh that's somewhat of a vague question, but uh, yeah, always the the uh, the world macroeconomics always affects every mineral company. That's that's just the way it works. Um, I mentioned during the presentation that uh, I'm always very focused on being a poly commodity explorer, um, and uh, for that reason, so that we're not at the whim of uh, of the market, and and we can we can be agile if required. So. Uh, at the moment, we don't see any big effect on on what we're doing at Tempest in with the world uh, changes, the, the the conflicts, and all the other things that's happening. Um, but that that is possible. Uh, one of the one of the possible, um, I guess, ironically, one of the the possible outcomes is that the price of gold might actually go to where it should be instead of being uh, somewhat uh, lower than everyone thinks it should be right now. Well, just on that note as well, we've had someone else ask about what you feel is the importance of gold. I think here they're probably referring to your PNG project. What can you tell okay. us about gold and the importance from um, the the project you have in Papua New Guinea? Uh, specifically in in Papua New Guinea, it's that's the primary commodity there. It's uh, Papua New Guinea's produced a, a huge percentage of uh, of the world's gold. Um, the world's biggest gold mine is is there in Freeport. Um, yeah, and and we think there's there's a great opportunity to, for that project to expand because currently it's a uh, uh, it could be the tip of the iceberg. It, it's a, well known to be a, an epithermal deposit, but uh, no one's looked around or underneath that. So there could be could be mega giant uh, porphyries and other types of things uh, floating around underneath it. And certainly some of the geology uh, supports that. So yeah, gold's, gold's critical to that project. That is, that is what it is. Fantastic, excellent. Thanks, Don, for answering those questions. Um, just going back to the audience, do we still have Mr. Iggy Tan with us? Yes, I, I'm here. Uh, Hi there. We've had a question come through um, from one of our audience members wants to know how important copper is, do you believe, how important copper is for the future? Yeah, there is uh, two and a half times more copper in an electric vehicle compared to a normal ICE vehicle. So copper is a critical material. Uh, copper is also in lithium batteries as the uh, anode collector uh, so um, uh, you know there's uh, enough studies that show there's not enough copper mines being developed uh, to 
even meet the EV demand, not uh, let alone the uh, grid storage demand. So co copper is a critical material. Thank you. And we've um, got another question for you, if you're happy to answer from um, Mr. Stefan. John has asked, well, as other entrants come into the lithium battery market, do you believe we may be seeing more lithium fires in the future? Uh, more lithium. Sorry, I, I missed that last bit. Sorry, lithium battery fires in the future. Could we see more of them, even though I know you're doing work to help with regards to fires? As more entrants come into the lithium world, do you think there will be more lithium battery fires? I, I also, uh, I also, uh, I've said that uh, lithium battery is a great battery and it's not going to go away. Uh, I also chair a, a lithium company. Um, so the, the lithium battery is a great battery. And to be fair, uh, when there's a lithium battery fire, it's all over the news. Uh, but there is uh, plenty of fires from petrol engines, uh, but they don't get on the news. So uh, if, you, if you think in the long term, um, the, the, the lithium battery fire is, uh, is just happens to be uh, the topic today. But uh, they are great batteries. Excellent. And um, just moving on to Mr. John Davis now, we have a couple of questions um, um, coming up for you. I'm just looking through to see if I can see a name. Sorry, we have, do you expect other opportunities to pop up in Senegal for Haranga? Uh, thanks, Rachel. Um, yes, certainly. Um, we've been reviewing a number of other projects uh, and certainly in the lithium space as well. Um, the historic exploration uh, for uh, lithium-based mineralization has been very minimal um, in this part of the world. And uh, particularly around this Soraya granite, there are um, some certainly footprint information from historical surveys that indicate uh, pathfinders that could suggest uh, certainly lithium-based um, mineralization pigmentites um, uh, uh, potential. Certainly, um, we've tied up pretty much the main basis of the uranium potential in the southeastern corner of, of um, Senegal, but also the gold, further gold potential is significant, and we're, folk and we're certainly looking on all those aspects. Excellent. Thank you. And... Um... Sticking with you, John, how much do you believe we will see with the growth of uranium? Well, I mean, it's uh, it, it, it has come with a bit of history, obviously. Um, but that aside, and, and I think that's pretty much passed us by, that the big thing with uranium and the footprint of a uranium plant is significantly smaller then and and as I've said before, there's basically no emissions, zero emissions, uh, and and so on. So I think the move has to go towards uranium, um, and just on the basis of there is a lot of it around, uh, particularly in Australia also, and uh, there are a lot of plants out there that are crying out for feedstock uh, from explorers who may be producing yellow cake. Uh, which is sold on to nuclear power plants for concentration and so on. So I think the, the scope to advance with uranium now uh, is being seen and we'll certainly see a big move in that way going forward. Excellent. Thanks for your answers there, John. Um, just finally, one last question. Coming back to you again, Don, Sam Henderson is asking, he would like to know whether Tem Prime will fo their prime focus would be to invest more in gold projects, or is it lithium projects you'll be focusing on more? Uh, we're not we're not uh, overly commodity focused, to to be honest. Um, but certainly, uh, precious and base metals are more of a focus at the moment than lithium. Excellent. And just on that note, Don, would you like to give our audience some closing remarks on your presentation from today? Sure thing. Uh, one thing that we didn't speak a huge amount in the presentation was was copper, and we have a, um, a somewhat of a focus on copper at our Malaya uh, area in particular. 
um, Iggy Iggy touched on this a moment ago that there's a there's a, a gross shortage coming in in that and uh, the the supply and demand are completely completely apart from each other. So um, I think that's a, a great opportunity for companies uh, like Tempest who are who are quite leveraged to that and have a, a great opportunity. Um, we're keen to to grow as a company and and do lots of new things and uh, and build new projects. And uh, hopefully our, our value will, will reflect that as we go forward. Excellent. Thanks so much, John and Don. And going back to John, would you like to just conclude with some closing remarks? Uh, thanks, Rachel. Yes, I think um, one of the comments regarding Haranga is a fairly uh, a young company, only uh, listed approximately 18, just over 18 months ago. Um, we've had some immediate success it, outlying a, a mineral resource estimate for uranium uh, under Jork Code 2012. And we are moving forward on a, a number of fronts, obviously expanding on the uranium base, the gold base in Senegal, but we're also looking for other streamlined projects that are going to add to our portfolio um, as we move forward. So I think it's early, it's relatively early stage for Haranga, but we're moving forward quickly and intend to comp uh, continue in that vein. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much, Mr. Don Smith, Mr. Iggy Tan, and Mr. John Davis. On behalf of Kalkai Media, I'd like to thank our audience and our presenters for their meaningful insights and for answering any queries with such great analysis. Now, on this note, I'd like to thank our audience for attending the webinar. We hope each one found this session informative. And if you want to delve any further into the equity market, if um, for any updates, if our audience could visit at our media site, www.halkimedia.com forward slash au also visit our equity research website www.calkine.com.au you can email us if you have any more questions info at calkinemedia.com stay tuned for calkine media for our upcoming invest nest series thank you so much for attending today and thank you so much for our presenters have a great day thanks guys <music>